This podfic contains content that may be disturbing for some viewers, including mentions of violence, guns, and physical and emotional abuse. Please check out the complete list of content warnings in the description, and proceed with caution if you are sensitive to these topics. Hello my lovely little gemstones, it's Afira, and today I'll be reading When the Chips Are Down by Whiskey with Patron. Chapter 15. The Hacker Forums Are Losing Their Shit Remy smacked Price upside the head. Stop moving so much, you're rocking the car. Price scoffed. Well, it's not my fault these cheap seats are so uncomfortable, she complained as she shifted in her seat for the fourth time in ten seconds. Andy grimaced as she watched Price try to adjust her seatbelt. It's also not our fault that you're used to driving around in a Rolls Royce. I'm looking at your bank account right now. How did you get so loaded doing small jobs? Easy. Take someone in to whoever wants them, get the reward, move on to the next person the next day. Quick and easy. She nudged Andy with her elbow. You're taking up all of my seat space. Am not. Am too. Price, I swear to God, I will get out my gun again. Yeah, Princey, stop being so difficult. Don't call me that. Andy heard Thomas and Patton heave simultaneous sighs at the argument. They had only been driving through the city for a few minutes, but Andy was already fed up with being stuck in this car with some prissy bounty hunter and a frustrated Remy. Not only that, but all of her senses were on high alert. She scanned the streets around them for anyone who could possibly be tracking them. She didn't know if anyone had followed them from Thomas's house, but she was almost sure someone had. It could be that one blue car on the street far behind them, or the cyclist riding along the side of the road, or the couple walking on the sidewalk hand in hand, or... Andy shook her head and turned to look ahead at her laptop. She was fine for now. Nothing was wrong. She just had to keep a level head. That, and she wanted to know exactly where Thomas was taking them. She poked her head into the front seat. Thomas, where are we going? I think I might know a place, Thomas said. His knuckles were almost white on the steering wheel. Just make sure no one's following us. Andy's fingers danced on the keyboard of her laptop as she scanned the area. Pretty sure we're good, she said. I'm not seeing any familiar signals in our general area. A rap isn't that stupid, Price scoffed. They could be blocking stuff. They can do that, right? I don't know technological hacker stuff. Andy rolled her eyes. I'm not answering stupid questions. She turned back to her laptop. She loaded up a dark web forum page she frequented and set it aside to look at later. Despite her own reassurances that they were in the clear, she still kept an eye out for anyone who might be following them. It couldn't hurt to play it safe. So, the place I'm thinking of taking you guys, Thomas began as they turned down another street. It's got its advantages, but it could also be a little dangerous. Remy leaned into the front seat, cutting off his argument with Price. Tell us the bad stuff first. Thomas paused. There might be people from Wrath's Blade there. Then why are we going? Remy practically yelled. It's a safe house, Thomas interrupted before Remy could panic. There's no violence allowed there, and anyone who breaks that rule is banned, then automatically put on everyone's shit list and sent out as a wanted person. It's been in this city for a long time. It's run by a neutral crowd in the criminal underground. Every official gang and organization has connections there, and everyone is welcome no matter what. Price rolled her eyes. Ugh, that place. I've been there. It's kind of a shitty hotel, but it's a good area to get information if that's what you're looking for. Andy leaned forward. Are we talking about the Critic House? Thomas nodded. Yeah, you help organize their databases, right? Yeah, I've sent out a few bounties. The Critic House? Patton mumbled. I... I think I've been there. Remy lowered his sunglasses to stare at Patton. You've been to this place? When? A long time ago when I was still involved in the criminal underground stuff. As long as we're in their building, no one can touch us, Thomas said. Are you sure that's a good idea? Remy asked. Oh, cool your jets, Price said. Do you know how many times a target of mine has gone in that place and made it way too difficult for me to get there? I always have to bail on those jobs. I don't have time to deal with it. But what if there are RAF agents already there? Remy asked. No one is allowed to forcibly escort anyone else from the premises. Patton told him. Kidnapping isn't allowed. Neither are murder or interrogation. I can't believe I didn't think of going to the critic house before. Remy let out a frustrated huff. But if we need to leave, Wrath is going to be right on our ass, along with pretty much every bounty hunter in the area. This is a bad idea, Pat. What other options do we have? Andy said. Thomas furrowed his brow. Remy has a point. We would just be driving you right into Wrath's hands. We can try getting a hotel for tonight. For now, we can just jump around the city and see where things go from there. Andy considered their options. The Crick House might be the safest, but it wouldn't remain that way for long. 
From what she knew, Patton's main goal was to throw Rath off his trail so he could live a few more years without having to worry about being stabbed in the back. Trying to work things out with Rath was not an option. They would never listen to reason. That's a better idea, Patton admitted. At least for now. If I ever left the Critic House, Rath would kill me the first chance they got. All right. Thomas turned down another street. As long as we're bouncing around, anyone want coffee? As Remy perked up and started pleading with Thomas to find a Starbucks, Andy tried to tune him out. She was too focused on something on her screen that was really bothering her. She had gone into her dark web forum page of fellow hackers, just to see if there was anyone else who had information on the bounty on Patton Hart's head. There hadn't been anything new for the past couple minutes, but a new post had popped up that caught her eye. There was a user whose most recent post concerned her. She read over the thread topic again. Willing to pay money for info on Patton Hart. She chewed her lip, debating with herself. She clicked on the post. Anyone who has any info possible on Patton Hart, please respond. DM me and I'll get you on a private message board for the info. Can pay in either money or free hacking job. Andy left the post and typed Patton Hart into the forum search bar. Her eyes widened when she saw the sheer amount of threads. There were so many hackers looking for him. There was more posts asking for information than posts actually providing the information everyone was searching for. Andy brought up a normal Google tab and typed in Patton's name. Nothing relevant came up. No social media, no pictures, no past forum posts on any site, no old MySpace or Facebook accounts, no information on any current or past jobs he might have had. It was as if he'd been wiped off the face of the earth. The only thing she saw was stuff about other people with the same last name, but she doubted any of them were relatives of his. They looked nothing like him. No wonder people were searching for information on him. He had no internet presence anywhere. Andy switched back to her other browser with the forum page. She combed through the posts asking for Patton. So many people were looking for him. She couldn't blame people for being all over him. She'd seen how much the bounty was. Even she had been a little tempted to turn him in when she saw it. She paused in her scrolling when she saw one post out of the ordinary. Is Patton Hart alive? The topic screamed on her screen. She clicked on it. All I need to know is whether or not Patton Hart is alive. I don't care about the bounty, and I don't care about his issue with Wrath's Blade. I am an unaffiliated acquaintance of Patton's, and I simply need to know if he is alive. I am willing to pay for information on his well-being. Andy scrolled down. None of the responses were offering information. Most were asking if the original poster knew anything about Patton and was trying to bribe them into giving information. The original user had added an edit to the original post, saying, Do not respond if you are simply going to ask for information. I am merely an acquaintance, and I will not be giving any information out to anyone who wishes to cause him harm. Please stop asking. Andy's cursor hovered over the username of the original poster of the thread. It read Logic and Crofters. Andy had seen that user a couple times before, but she'd never really spoken to them. As Thomas pulled the car into a Starbucks parking lot, she clicked on the username and went to their direct messages. She hesitated, wondering if contacting this person was really the best idea. They could just be a wrath agent trying to find Patton. However, she didn't get that vibe from this person. She knew next to nothing about them, but she was sure that what they said about knowing Patton was the truth. She typed into the text box and sent a message. Logan stared in awe at the message that popped up in his inbox. He'd made a forum post on a website for unaffiliated hackers just a half hour ago. He wasn't expecting any answers so soon. A user by the screen name My Chemical Anxiety was in his inbox with a message that he hadn't expected to see. Patton Hart's alive, it said. Nothing else. He didn't know what to think. This person had just shown up in his messages, said that and nothing else. He didn't know if he could trust them. Logan's fingers hovered over the keyboard. He hesitated, then typed a reply. Do you have proof? He sat back and waited for a response. A new message appeared on the screen just a minute later. I don't know if I can trust you, man. You might want to hurt him, and that's not what I want. How do I know you're not going to turn him in? Logan thought about it. There was no way to prove that he was Patton's friend without giving away any personal information. I suppose you would just have to trust me. Just know that I do not wish to cause harm to Patton or anyone close to him. I just need to know if he's alive. I do not need information about where he is or who he's with. Just his current state of health. There was no response for a couple minutes. Logan wondered if my chemical anxiety had simply given up. A new message popped up. It was an audio message. Logan hesitated, but he clicked the play button. Get me a black coffee, said a voice that sounded close to whatever device they were speaking into. That must have been the voice behind the user Logan was talking to. What size, huh? Asked a more distant voice, and Logan's eyebrows shot up. That was the voice of Remy, Patton's close friend. Small, said the first voice. Patton, you want anything? 
Patton's voice was a little muffled, likely due to his proximity to the microphone, but Logan would have recognized it no matter what. Hmm? Oh, uh, I guess a hot chocolate? A small one. I'll pay for it. <sighs> Babe, don't worry, I got it, Remy's voice said. Thomas, I'll pay for yours too. Princey, you're getting your own shit. You can afford it. A mess of sound came through the speakers as the holder of the microphone shifted their device and shut it off. Another message popped up. Is that good enough proof? Logan typed back. Yes. Thank you for letting me know he's alive. I can repay you however you'd like. He pressed send. He was a little surprised at the next message that came up. Don't worry about it. I'm just trying to help out. Then I will simply express my gratitude by offering my hacking services, should you ever need extra assistance. I can also provide extra services, such as weapons and surveillance, should you need it. I owe you for this. Sounds good. I'll slide into your DMs if I ever need help. That was the end of the conversation, as far as Logan was concerned. He closed the tab with the forum page on it and breathed a sigh of relief. So Patton was alive. Logan didn't know where he was or who exactly he was with, but that was definitely Patton's voice. And if he was with Remy, surely he was safe. Remy was very capable of protecting Patton. Logan shifted in his seat, and a hot flash of pain shot through his side. The wound in his side still hurt. He would have to check on it later, or get Janice or DW to do so for him. He settled back on the couch. Patton was safe and alive. That would have to be enough for now. Chapter 16. The Emo Kid is Having a Panic Attack Virgil stared at the gun pointed at his head. His heart raced. Oh no, he was going to die here, wasn't he? What should he do? Should he try and run before they shot him? Should he stay completely still and do whatever they wanted so they didn't hurt him? That seemed like the safest option, but what if doing what they wanted involved letting them hurt him? Wait, hold on, a new voice said behind the door. That's a kid. The gun lowered and the door was flung open. A man stood in the doorway, a woman at his side. He held a gun in his hands, and the woman had a hand on his shoulder. His eyes fell on the snake pin on Virgil's hoodie, but he must have thought that it referred to the bank and didn't know about the correlation to the criminal organization they were in, because he said nothing about it. The man grabbed Virgil's arm and pulled him inside the room. He shut the door, a frantic look in his eyes. Virgil took a millisecond to scan his surroundings. He was in a large room with couches near the far wall around a coffee table. A TV was planted on the ground in front of the couches. A bunch of other people were lounging on the couches and watching whatever was on TV, but a couple were standing around holding weapons. Two people in jackets with yellow two-headed snakes blazoned on their jackets were being held at gunpoint over in the corner of the room. There's no reason for this, someone on the couch has called. If our friends paid off their goddamn debts, we'll be out of here. I've been here over a month, the man with the gun shouted. Virgil flinched at the noise. I'm not staying here any longer. Oh, come on, one of the Chimera employees scoffed. We don't hurt you, do we? That's not the point, the armed man snapped. Virgil wished he would stop shouting. I want out, and I don't give a shit that my asshole wife doesn't care enough to make one fucking payment to get me out of here. Hey, who's the emo kid? Someone from the couches asked. New hostage, I assume, the woman next to the armed man said. <laughs> or a spy to take us down, the man sneered, grip tightening on his gun. Virgil took a step back. Oh god, he shouldn't have come down here. This was a bad idea. Someone on the couches stood and turned to face the armed man. Look, I've been here for two months, and you don't see me waving a gun around. Sit the fuck down and let it go. No! The armed man all but screamed. Virgil resisted the urge to cover his ear to block them from his verbal assault. This is the furthest I've gotten in the past month, and I'm not stopping now. Your stupid plans never work, the person argued. Seriously, can't you just wait? I'm done waiting. I- He stopped mid-sentence. Virgil wondered why. Then he heard it. Footsteps were making their way towards the door. Virgil skittered back as the door flew open. A group of people flooded in, and he was surprised to see that Mr. Chimera was at the head of the group, a gun in his hand. His gaze immediately fell on Virgil. His eyes widened. Virgil, what are you- He didn't get to finish the sentence. Someone grabbed Virgil's arm and yanked him away from Mr. Chimera, earning a loud yelp from Virgil. The person held him close to their chest. Too close. Way too close. And when Virgil started squirming to get away, they pressed something cold and metal to the side of his head. He froze. Oh no. Anyone moves, the man holding him growled. And the kid dies. This is exactly why Janice never wanted kids. He stared at Virgil in shock, wondering how the hell the kid had gotten down here and why he had even come here. Had Virgil heard enough of the conversation Janice had with Teal to know where to go, or did he end up here by coincidence? 
And why the hell did he come down here if he knew it would be dangerous? Janice's gaze swept the room. Most of the hostages were sitting on the couches, staring at the scene with wide, terrified eyes. But a select few were holding some of Chimera's agents at gunpoint. The armed man holding Virgil was, unfortunately, a hostage that Janice was familiar with. He'd thrown a fit or two down here, but they had never ended up like this. Janice had considered letting this man go before, but the guy's wife still needed to repay some debts and needed some incentive. Maybe Janice should have listened to his instinct and let the man go as soon as he started getting aggressive. Most of the other hostages lowered their weapons, glancing warily at the man with the gun to Virgil's head. They seemed uncertain, as if they hadn't expected this. They likely hadn't. This particular hostage often went off the rails, even with his own plans. He wanted out of the building, and probably wouldn't stop until he accomplished just that. Janice held up his hands in surrender. All right, I won't do anything. What do you want? The few agents who were no longer in danger of being shot looked to Janice for guidance. They were standing on the balls of their feet, ready to strike at a moment's notice. Janice slightly shook his head to tell them to back down. He was not risking Virgil's life. For now, playing along with this man's game was the best way to make sure Virgil stayed safe. The armed hostage grit his teeth, glaring at Janice with a feral sort of rage burning in his eyes. I want out of this hellhole. That can be arranged, Janice said, and he wasn't lying for once. We will release you from our custody. Just lower the gun. The man shook his head. Janice caught the terrified look in Virgil's face. Virgil's chest rose and fell in rapid breaths, and Janice was afraid the kid would start hyperventilating right here and now. He was trembling from head to toe. What else do you want? Janice asked. He tried to keep his tone calm. He hadn't expected anything to escalate this far. He didn't want it to aggravate the man and make him escalate even further. I don't trust you, the man spat. Put down the weapons. All of you. Janice hesitated. He shifted his grip on his one weapon. He really should have brought a backup knife with him. However, he motioned to the group of agents behind him to put their weapons down. He heard them all set their various bats, knives, and guns on the floor. He knelt down, keeping his eyes on the man, and very slowly set his pistol on the ground. He kept his hands up in surrender and straightened again. Okay, the weapons are down, Janice said. Now let the kid go and we'll bring you back to your wife. Oh, no, no, I don't want back with her. The man was shaking from rage. She got me into this place by taking loans to fuel her fucking shopping addiction. She did this to me. I don't want to be around her ever again. That's fine, Janice said. His heart pounded faster as the man's finger twitched on the trigger of the gun. We don't have to take you back to her. We'll set you free wherever you want. The man sneered. How do I know you're not lying? The muzzle of the gun pressed closer to Virgil's temple. Virgil's eyes widened and his breath quickened. Janice glanced from the man with the gun, the other armed and confused hostages, Virgil and the unarmed agents in the corner of the room. There were so many different things in the situation, it was hard to know what to focus on. One of the hostages on the couch was biting her nails. The show on the TV was still going, an agent in the corner shifted her weight, ready to attack. Virgil's breathing was so loud, reminding him how high the stakes were. Someone accidentally nudged a metal bat on the floor behind him. He took a deep breath. Too many things were happening. He couldn't have a shutdown now. He needed to keep a level head. Janice looked back up at the man. You just have to trust me, he managed to say, but God, his voice was already getting quieter, and speaking felt awful, and he needed to move somehow, but if he did, Virgil would die. Thank fuck DW managed to notice his growing distress. Listen, she said, you'll just have to take our word for it. We will let you go if you let the kid go. I promise. Her voice shook. She didn't like guns, despite the constant presence of them in her line of work. It was a miracle she was able to keep her head on straight. The man looked from Janice to DW. Janice silently prayed the man would believe them. One of the other armed hostages shifted her grip on her gun. Janice didn't realize what was going on until it was too late. She raised her gun and fired. Virgil screamed and collapsed, and for one horrifying moment, Janice thought he was the one that was shot. The armed man whirled around and fired at his fellow hostage. Blood sprayed on the wallpaper, and she crumpled. Janice rushed for Virgil. He heard a thud as someone, likely DW, tackled the armed man and pinned him to the wall. Chimera agents grabbed their weapons and began rushing around, trying to fix the situation, but Janice was only focused on Virgil. Virgil was curled up on the floor, clutching his hood over his head, shaking like a leaf in the wind. His breathing hadn't slowed at all, so Janice took that as a sign that he hadn't been shot and wasn't in the process of dying. Janice looked him over for any sign of blood without touching the kid. Unsure if this was a meltdown or a panic attack and if it was okay to get close. Luckily, he appeared physically unharmed. Janice took a deep breath to try and calm his own nerves. Virgil, are you hurt? 
His voice was still quiet, but at least he could still manage to speak. Virgil quickly shook his head under his hood. Am I allowed to touch you? Janice asked. A quick nod was Virgil's response. Janice gently took Virgil's shoulders and stood. Virgil followed the movement, uncurling from his former position, but still hunched over. He whined in distress, voice hitching with every frantic breath. Janice guided Virgil over to the door, motioning for the agents to move out of the way. They left the room, leaving behind the ruckus of the panicked hostages and the frantic agents. The lesson noise let Janice regain some control over his own senses a little. First thing to prioritize, get Virgil somewhere quiet. The ideal place would be Janice's office, but Virgil needed quiet now. The elevator would have to do for the moment. They walked down the hall, Janice with his hands on Virgil's shoulders to guide him, while Virgil kept his gaze on the ground. His breathing hadn't slowed yet. They finally reached the elevator. The doors opened as soon as Janice pressed the button, and he guided Virgil into the elevator. He pressed the button for the first floor. The doors shut, closing off the sound of the ruckus from the hostage's living room. Virgil covered his hands with his sweater sleeves and clamped them over his ears over the hood of his sweater. He gently rocked back and forth on his feet. He was still breathing fast, and a cry escaped his lips through the hyperventilating. Janice was not very equipped to deal with this. However, he would have to do his best. He kept one hand on Virgil's shoulder. Virgil, can you try and take a deep breath for me? Virgil sobbed again, but he nodded. All right, Janice began. Try to breathe with me, okay? He took a deep, exaggerated breath. Virgil's breath hitched as he tried to inhale, and the air left his lungs in a quick sob. The second breath seemed to be a little easier, with a few less sobs. The third and fourth seemed to calm him down more, and the fifth nearly matched Janice's breath perfectly. Virgil took a sixth, shuddering breath as the elevator doors opened. He gave another distressed whine. Janice guided Virgil out of the elevator and down the hall. Janice was lucky almost everyone from the top floor was downstairs instead of up here. They reached the door to DW's office. Janice took one hand off Virgil's shoulder to open it. They could settle in DW's office, but the lights in Janice's room were much dimmer, and Janice just couldn't deal with such bright lights. He was vaguely aware of Roman and Remus sitting on DW's couch and reading books from her shelf as he and Virgil made their way to Janice's office. Janice nudged the door open and guided Virgil inside. The dim yellow lights were an immediate relief for Janice, but he still had to focus on Virgil. Virgil squirmed away from Janice and scurried into the blanket fort his brothers had set up. Janice crouched down and peered in through the blankets. Virgil had immediately curled into a ball again, knees to his chest. He grabbed a blanket and wrapped it around his shoulders. He briefly covered his hands with his sleeves and flapped them, before burying his face in the blanket. He whined again and rocked back and forth in his seat. Janice hesitated, but he crawled into the fort and sat down. The light was even softer in here. With all the soft blankets and pillows from his couch, it felt like the perfect place to relax. He might have to consider keeping this fort. It was quite lovely. Anything I can do to help, Virgil? Janice asked. His voice was hardly more than a whisper. Speaking felt awful. He wasn't going to be able to say much. Virgil peeked up from the blanket to look at Janice. He seemed to hesitate, but he scooted across the floor towards Janice. He sat right next to Janice and hid his face in the blanket again. Janice wasn't 100% sure what to do with this. He assumed Virgil wanted some sort of comfort, so Janice carefully placed a hand on the kid's back. Luckily, that seemed to be the right thing to do. Virgil leaned against Janice and huddled further into his sweater. His shoulders shook. Another sob left his throat. He kept rocking in his seat as he stuck his bat necklace in his mouth. Janice gently rubbed Virgil's back. It's all right, Virgil, he whispered. It's okay. You're safe now. Nothing is going to happen to you. Now that everything had slowed down and they were safe, Janice allowed himself to relax as he comforted Virgil. His brain had reached its limit. Everything had happened all at once, and Janice hadn't even processed all of it yet. He tried to speak again, but his voice had given up on him. There were so many things he was going to have to deal with. Someone had gotten shot, one of the hostages. He hadn't even told anyone what to do with the hostage who started this whole situation. He tried not to focus on that, however. He just sat in the blanket fort with Virgil, trying to stay calm. He heard someone enter the room, and a small hand pulled a blanket aside to let someone peek into the fort. Roman and Remus stood there, Remus holding Virgil's backpack. Remus slowly shuffled into the fort. He set Virgil's backpack on the floor in front of him and retreated from the fort. Roman let the blanket fall over the entrance again. Virgil lifted his head. He grabbed for the backpack and tried to unzip it. It took a couple tries, but he managed to get it open. He reached in and grabbed something that looked like a stuffed animal in the shape of a cat. He hugged it to his chest and buried his face in the blanket again. Janice flinched as he heard DW's office door open and close. 
Jan, the voice called out. You in here? Janice couldn't respond, not with his voice at least. He tugged one of his gloves off with his teeth and snapped his fingers twice to alert T.W. to where he was. Footsteps approached from her office. She pulled a blanket aside and poked her head into the fort. Hey, you two, she whispered. You both okay? Physically, at least? Janice nodded. He wanted to ask what was going on with the hostages now, but he couldn't speak. However, he didn't need to. D.W. seemed to already know what he wanted to ask. The hostages are fine, she said, keeping her voice quiet. Except for the one that was shot. She's still got a heartbeat, but we don't know how long that's going to last. The one who started this mess has been restrained and knocked out, and we're going to drop him off at his wife's house. We're not sure what to tell the girlfriend of the hostage who was shot, but Moggy said she'd figure that out later. We're working things out. The other hostages look pretty scared, so I was thinking we could get another Chimera leader in here to talk to them while I handle the legal stuff. Maybe Emil Pacani from Side Hill. Would that be okay? Janice nodded again. Getting Emil to come in was a good idea. That man could probably calm down a herd of rabid dogs if he wanted to. The remaining hostages would need his help. Cool. I'll give him a call. Make sure Virgil knows he shouldn't go wandering the building without an escort. Let me know if you need anything. With that, D.W. disappeared from the fort. Janice took a deep breath. So many things to deal with. He didn't know if he could handle it all. Mr. Chimera? Janice jumped a little at the quiet voice. He turned his head to look down at Virgil. He'd uncovered his face a little and was staring up at Janice with teary green eyes. Thank you, Virgil muttered. Janice wanted to say something back. He dug around in his pocket for his phone and pulled it out. He opened the notes app and typed something with his one ungloved hand. He held his phone out for Virgil to read. Call me Janice. Chapter 17 Well, now I'm kind of worried about the snake man. Virgil kept a blanket around his shoulders as he sat in the pillow fort, listening to Mr. Chimera talk about serious crime things with the people in his office. Virgil hadn't left the pillow fort, but Roman and Remus had joined them soon after Mr. Chimera had to leave and deal with whatever happened on the seventh floor. The three of them just sat and listened to the voices in the room. As soon as Emil Pacani gets here from Side Hill, Mr. Chimera's voice said, I'll send him down to the seventh floor. The hostages are going to need some comfort. Alex, I want the shot hostage's girlfriend on the phone to sort out the debt she owes and inform her of the injury. We'll be letting her debt go and paying for all of her medical needs. Teal, get a couple of others to help you take the hostage who was shot to the infirmary if that hasn't already been done. If it has, assist with any medical procedures that need to occur. Or take the hostage to the hospital if extra assistance is needed. Moggy, you reassign the hostage guards to different interrogation assignments for the day. Roman leaned in to Virgil. What are they talking about? He whispered. Virgil shrugged, not in the mood to engage in conversation. He wasn't in the mood to do anything, really. He just wanted to go home, even though he knew that was far from being an option. Virgil saw people's legs walking past the fort as they passed by on their way to the door, having been giving their tasks. D.W., Mr. Chimera's voice said, is there anything left to handle? A few, D.W. said. I'll be changing the security around the hostages as soon as things calm down. We should put more security cameras in their hallways. Also, I've made a note to look into every hostage pass before we kidnap them. We don't want any more people with violent tendencies causing harm for other hostages. Thank you, Mr. Chimera said. Virgil heard more footsteps as D.W. left the room. Her footsteps were immediately replaced by another person's as they entered the room. Jenny, said an excited voice. Do you how do, you wonderful snake? Virgil raised an eyebrow. Had he heard that wrong? It wouldn't be the first time he misheard something, but he was fairly certain this new person had said, do you how do, which made absolutely no sense grammatically. Dr. Pacani, Mr. Chimera said. Lovely to see you again. Or do you prefer Dr. Chimera? Either or is fine, said this new person, Dr. Pacani. Oh, sorry, am I a little too loud? He said in a quieter voice. We don't have to speak verbally if you don't want to. No, I should. Don't worry about me. It's the hostages downstairs that need help. Oh, Janice, don't be a Steven. You're working too hard to make things better and harming yourself in the process. If you're working yourself to a shutdown or burnout, you need to take a little while to relax. I don't remember booking a therapy session today, Emil. This is just friendly advice, Jenny. Go home and take a break. Dorothy and I can handle everything. A pause. 
Are you sure? Yepers. Remember, don't force yourself to speak if you can't handle it. You and D.W. are the bosses here, Janny. You can shut your door and not let anyone in if you don't want to. You make the decisions. Thank you, Emil. I'll keep that in mind. No problem, Bob. It's Janice. I know. Take a break, Jan. I'll see you when I sort things out. Dr. Bacani's footsteps walked past the pillow fort and left the room. Virgil poked his head out of the blankets just in time to see Dr. Bacani's khaki-clad legs walk out the door. Virgil turned his head to look at Mr. Canera. He was leaning back against his desk, staring at the floor. He glanced up at Virgil, but said nothing. Virgil retreated back into the fort. He didn't know what Mr. Chimera's deal was, but he definitely looked stressed. Virgil couldn't blame him. Everything that had just happened was intense, to say the least. Virgil shuddered as he thought about it. That gunshot still echoed in his head. He'd hardly seen anything, but he remembered seeing someone on the floor surrounded by something red. Remus's hand rested on Virgil's shoulder. Deep breaths, Virg. Virgil did as Remus said. The breath was shaky, but he managed to take another that was more even. He really needed to calm down. He poked his head out of the blankets again to look at Mr. Chimera. He told Virgil to call him Janice, but it felt odd to refer to an adult by their first name. Was it really okay to call him that? He wouldn't know if he didn't try. Janice. Mr. Chimera looked up at the sound of Virgil's voice. Yes. Are you okay? Mr. Chimera blinked at the question. Yes, I'm perfectly fine, Virgil. I believe we're going to leave for home a bit earlier than I previously thought we would. I don't think you three should be around here at the moment. He narrowed his eyes slightly. Also, a word of advice to all three of you. Do not wander the building without an escort. I don't need a dead kid on my hands. Got it? Virgil swallowed nervously. He already regrets saying anything. He nodded frantically. Good, Mr. Chimera said. His tone short and clipped. Your father would skin me alive if I let him down. That's not an exaggeration. He nearly jumped three feet in the air when the phone on his desk rang. He snatched it off his desk as if desperate to stop its ringing, then hesitated before bringing it to his ear. Hello, he said. He paused. Yes, I want her on the phone. She needs to know. Pause. Thank you. He took a deep breath, as if trying to calm himself. He was silent for another moment. Then he plastered on a smile, as if the person on the other end of the call could see it. Hello, Miss Short. I called because I have some things to discuss with you. Repaying your debt is no longer necessary. Silence. The smile wilted. I'm... I'm afraid there might be an issue. He sighed and shut his eyes. Miss Short, I regret to inform you. Earlier this morning, another hostage threw a fit. He got a hold of a few weapons, and he swallowed. Miss, your girlfriend was shot. There was silence from both Mr. Chimera and the other voice on the phone. The person on the other end suddenly started shouting, and while Virgil couldn't make out what she was saying, Mr. Chimera apparently could. I know, she, he said over her yelling. This, it wasn't supposed to happen. We didn't know the other hostage was that hostile, and he stopped and just sighed as the other person yelled through the phone. Virgil could have sworn he saw tears in Mr. Chimera's eyes, but it was hard to tell from this distance. Virgil felt someone tug on his sleeve. He glanced next to him to see Remus, a scared look on his face. Is that a lady yelling on the phone? He asked quietly. Virgil nodded. Remus glanced out at Janice. Is it mother? Remus asked. No, Virgil said immediately. It's not. I don't even think Janice knows how to contact her. You're safe. Remus relaxed a little. Okay. Still, he cuddled up to Virgil, looking more like a five-year-old than an eleven-year-old. Virgil wrapped an arm around him. It had been years since they started living with Patton, but some things were just hard to shake. The shouting on the phone faltered. I'm sorry, Janice repeated. His voice was quiet, hardly more than a whisper. This has never happened before. We didn't know the other hostage would do something like this. I am incredibly sorry that I let things get out of hand. I am letting your debt go, and I will pay for any medical bills. She isn't dead yet, but others have reported that she is currently in an unstable state. Should there be anything else you need financial help with, I am willing to support you. Virgil heard someone sniffling on the other end of the line. Janish's shoulders stiffened. If you like, I can arrange a meeting in order to discuss this further. 
I really am sorry, Miss Short. I will not be available for the rest of the day, but my substitute, Maggie Sailor, would be more than willing to speak with you in person later, and I'm sure she can let you see your girlfriend if you wish. I will transfer your call back to Alex. He took the phone away from his ear and set it back on the desk. He took out his cell phone and typed on it for a moment before shoving it back in his pocket. Kids, I think we should go back to my place. DW will get a ride from someone else when she decides to come home. The three of you shouldn't be here right now. Roman and Remus exchanged identical confused glances, but Virgil understood why. Come on, guys. He crawled out of the fort, backpack clutched in one hand. He had tucked DW's copy of Fahrenheit 451 in the front pocket. He stood and pulled his backpack straps over his shoulders as Roman and Remus followed him. He felt a pang of concern rise up in his chest as Mr. Chimera started shoving things into a briefcase, movements halting and jerky. He hardly knew Mr. Chimera, but he wasn't going to pretend like he didn't care. This guy looked like he was on the verge of a breakdown. Mr. Chimera closed his briefcase and walked to the door. Virgil followed after him, gesturing for Roman and Remus to come with them too. They both scurried after Virgil, hand in hand. The three of them trailed Mr. Chimera out of DW's office and out into the hallways beyond. They walked towards the elevator, passing by concerned-looking employees, most of which were carrying weapons of some sort. The sight of them set Virgil on edge. However, they reached the elevator without any disasters happening. Virgil chewed on his bat pendant as the elevator doors opened and the four of them stepped inside. Mr. Chimera's demeanor didn't change when the doors shut. His back remained perfectly straight, and his face was void of any expression that might indicate some kind of emotion. However, Virgil noticed that he wouldn't stop tapping his finger on the handle of his briefcase. The doors opened, and they stepped out into the main bank area. I'm leaving early, he said to the bank tellers as they passed. Moggy's in charge. He said nothing more to them, and continued to the door. He held it open for Virgil and the twins, and they hurried out of the building. The three of them followed Mr. Chimera to the parking lot. Virgil put his briefcase into the trunk of the car. Roman and Remus hesitated, but they both clambered into the back seat as Mr. Chimera went around to the driver's seat. Janice, Virgil asked quietly, can I sit in the passenger seat? Mr. Chimera just nodded. He sat in the driver's seat and started the car. Virgil opened the door and sat in the passenger seat. He still didn't like the car. It was still too unfamiliar. However, he wasn't going to complain about the leg room. He buckled up and listened to Remus rolling the window up and down as Mr. Chimera pulled out of the parking lot. Virgil had actually wondered if Mr. Chimera knew how to drive, since he had DW do it for him, but it looked like Virgil had been wrong. He stared out the windshield as they drove along the streets. Mr. Chimera's grip was tight on the steering wheel. His entire body was tense. Virgil didn't blame him for being stressed. Everything that just happened was... Virgil put his hood over his head when his thoughts turned to the events that had occurred maybe a half hour ago. His panic had gone down a substantial amount, but God, he was glad they were leaving. It didn't take long to arrive at Mr. Chimera's house. They pulled up into the driveway, and as soon as Mr. Chimera parked the car, he left the driver's seat and strode to the house without grabbing his briefcase from the trunk. Virgil furrowed his brow and climbed out of the car. He hurried after Mr. Chimera. Janice looked really distressed. Despite hardly knowing the guy, Virgil wanted to make sure he would be okay at the very least. He followed Janice up the steps and into the house. Janice seemed to deflate as soon as he stepped inside, and he all but collapsed onto one of the couches in the living room. He buried his face in his gloved hands and didn't move. Virgil offhandedly wondered where Mr. Minder had gone, or if he was even still in the house. But his question was answered when the door to the right of the room opened and Mr. Minder stepped out. Janice, why are you... Mr. Minder stopped mid-sentence as his gaze fell on Janice. Oh, Jan, what's wrong? He shuffled over to Janice, one hand on his side as if it were hurting. He shot a glance at Virgil. Virgil just shrugged. Mr. Minder grabbed a blanket off the couch. Here. He draped it around Janice's shoulders. He turned and walked to the hallway, one hand still on his side. Roman, Remus, you two should go in the dining room. Virgil will join you shortly. Uh, Virgil, I would like to see you in the kitchen for a moment, if that's all right. Virgil's anxiety shot up. He didn't know what Mr. Minder wanted to talk to him about, but he automatically assumed he was in trouble or something. He clutched the straps of his backpack as he followed Mr. Minder down the hall to the kitchen door. It was already open. Mr. Minder nudged it shut once Virgil entered the kitchen. What do you want to talk to me about? Virgil asked. He couldn't make himself speak much louder than a whisper, mostly because of his panic attack earlier and the shutdown that had followed. Mr. Minder walked to the counter and turned on the electric kettle. Janice is unable to speak at the moment, otherwise I would ask him what happened this morning. He doesn't often shut down this badly after work, so I'm assuming something serious occurred. 
Am I correct? Virgil nodded slowly. Everything that happened was still a little hard to process, but he knew enough to explain the gist of it. I heard something about hostages throwing a fit on the seventh floor down. I don't know what's up with them keeping hostages or whatever, but... I don't know. I got curious and went down to look. Mr. Minder opened a cupboard and grabbed a ceramic mug. You went to check because you don't trust Janice, correct? Virgil really didn't want to admit it, since Mr. Minder was obviously very close with Mr. Chimera, but he nodded. Mr. Minder could read him like a book. I understand why, Virgil, Mr. Minder said. I'm not upset with you for distrusting him. What happened after you went downstairs? Virgil brought his bat necklace to his mouth and chewed on it for a moment. One of the people down there had a gun. He he got angry and he aimed it at me. Oh, but Mr. Chimera and a bunch of other people ran in first. Then the guy aimed a gun at me. Mr. Chimera tried to calm him down, but another lady who had a gun tried to shoot the guy who was aiming his gun at me. I don't know if she hit him. Someone got shot. I don't know who. He racked his brain, trying to recall the details. Try as he might, he couldn't remember who had been hit. Mr. Minder grabbed a bag of hot chocolate powder from the pantry and started scooping it into the mug with a spoon. That's all right, Virgil. It's okay if you can't recall everything. You've told me enough. He set the mug next to the kettle as he waited for it to heat up. On a lighter note, I found out something earlier that I believe you might be glad to know. Virgil blinked, a little confused. What is it? Your father, as of one hour ago, is still alive. Virgil's emotions immediately shot through a whole fucking roller coaster. There was shock at first, and that melted into overwhelming relief and happiness, then spiked into fear as to where Dad was and who he was with, and settled into sadness over the fact that Virgil couldn't see Dad right now. How do you know? Virgil asked through his battling emotions. I received information from a secondary source that I believed to be reliable. The water in the kettle began to boil, and Mr. Minder shut it off. He poured the water into the mug and mixed it with a spoon. It was just a voice recording, but Patton's voice was unmistakable. He is with Remy, as well as three other people. One is a hacker I contacted for information, another is named Thomas, and the third is someone they called Princey. I doubt that's their actual name, but that's all I know. I am unsure of whether he is accompanied by anyone else, but I don't think he would make the mistake of traveling in a large group, so those must be the only people he is with. As far as I know, Patton is safe. Virgil's feelings finally settled on relief. Is... Is there some way I can talk to him? I don't think that would be wise, Virgil. Your father is on the run from some powerful people, and he chose to cut off all communication with you for a reason. The hacker I spoke with is suspicious that I have malicious intent towards your father, and I don't want to test that suspicion by asking for a way to communicate. They could completely cut me off and not provide me with any more information if they decided I was dangerous. He finished stirring the hot chocolate and turned to the door. I'll take this to Janice. You can join your brothers in the dining room, and I'll make some lunch. Virgil jammed his hands in his pockets. This new information was a relief, but still, today had been more than exhausting to deal with. He needed some way to cool down. I can make lunch, he offered. Logan nodded, a faint smile on his face. Sounds good. I would suggest craft dinner. Both you and Janice seem to like it. With that, he walked back to the door and left with a hot chocolate in his hands. Virgil took off the backpack and set it on the floor. He started for the pantry, rolling up his sleeves along the way. Hopefully, cooking something would help him settle from his shutdown. As he grabbed a box of Kraft dinner and set it on the counter, only one thought was running through his mind. Dad was alive. He didn't know where Dad was, or how long he would remain safe, or how long it would take to see him again. But that was good enough for now. It had to be. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the series. If you like what you hear and you want to read more, you can find the link to the fic and the author in the description. If you want to check out other podfics I've done, you can click on the playlist linked on the screen. See you next time!